um, while we wait for our friends in some of their questions, I would like to start the conversation and then siguro and ask you, um, we can see that authoritarianism has become sort of a trend, not just in the Philippines, but worldwide. But you said that people have the natural desire for liberty. So, paano tayo, paano naging posible na pati yung ibang bansa parang nag-undergo nung cycle no, na liberal tapos authoritarian tapos sabay-sabay natin siyang na-experience. I think yun yung mas interesting. Bakit sabay-sabay natin lahat na-experience at present yung ganong klaseng mga rin? Yeah, I think first and foremost, one thing we should assume is that no system is st static. So that post-World War II st system, which is basically built on internationalism and liberalism, that wasn't going to last forever. Right? In fact, that was a long, when you think about it, it's actually a nice long honeymoon. Um, but it was, it, was a, it was bound to end. And there are many reasons why it ended. One of the reasons why it ended was, of course, economic injustice. Um, all of these populist revolutions happened after the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009, of course. And I think one of the things that liberals should do is actually revisit kind of what they mean when they talk about economic freedom. Because I am the kind of liberal who believes that ordered liberty can only be achieved through uh, kind of economic transfers. In Europe, what they would call social democracy. Um, and that's why I don't only work with FNM <laughs> because I, 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 am, I am a liberal and I'm a social democrat and I think those things go hand in hand. I think those things go perfectly hand in hand um, because if you are to order liberty, you need to order economic liberty as well. And that means state intervention to ensure equality in society. And if we're going to prevent a lot of these authoritarian systems from returning, we need to ensure some kind of economic quality. So that's one thing the system, that what's, what, that's one reason the system collapsed. The other reason the system collapsed is actually it's become very clear to me, it's because of the kind of information revolution we, we saw through social media. And a lot of this was pretty, ex, pretty explicit, you know? So you had um, people from Facebook, HQ, working with the Duterte administration, people from, with, with the Duterte campaign, people from Facebook HQ working with the Trump campaign, helping them spread false information, right? And then if you have these social media systems being weaponized by China and Russia, and so therefore their liberalism, which used to be, con con which, which used to be contained, is now easily and more cheaply exported through these communication systems. So I think those are the two major reasons, the kind of economic change and also the technological communication change that allowed for this shift into authoritarian populism. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I think at this point, Lalo, we can already go through the questions in the chat box. Sige, okay. Um, who, who could Ibarra be representing in Rizal's personal life according to Peter Albert Go? Could it be that Rizal used Ibarra's character as representation of his other persona, a persona he may have hidden in him? You know, that's not my reading. My reading is that Ibarra actually represents the generation of Father Burgos. If you look at the history, if you look at Ibarra, for example, his his story is very similar to the story of Father Jose Burgos. I mean, look at the look at the, the similarities. Both of them are Creole slash mestizo uh, slash mestizo español, right? Both of them are wealthy. Both of them are intellectuals. Both of them are framed for a crime which they never committed, right? So it's that framing. But they were framed. The result Burgos was executed, and both of them believed in that old school Creole tradition of partial reform more education, and everything will be okay. So I think when, he's, when he says that you know, Ibarra is naive, he's essentially saying that this older generation, this Creole liberal generation is passe. And this is not a reading that's mine alone. This is actually a reading that comes from Nick Joaquin in his um, very, very brilliant book, um, A Question of Heroes, which I think is you know, it's, it's the best introduction to Rizal around as far as I'm concerned. I mean, Joaquin still, Joaquin's still the best. Okay. Um, 
um, Mr. Go, does that answer your question? Uh, okay, he asked for the citation. Uh, the citation is in, in the essays of Rizal in the NHCP collection of results writings. It's there. Um, and I can, I can send you the page number if you send me an email. Um, Christopher Franco, how do we translate what we learned from Rizal today into the concrete political action in the Philippines at this point in our history? Well, I'm not a, not a policy person. I'm a, I'm a historian. Sometimes I dabble in policy. But I think uh, what's important, what Rizal is giving us is a lens. So, you know, it's a way to see the world, not a, not, not, not a concrete set of actions, because of course, the context he was involved in was kind of different. Although there are things that can be applied today. Like, for example, I discussed policing. You know, the major problem of the Philippines in Rizal's time and now is the problem of policing. So we really need to think about systematic reform of the police. I don't know what that means. You know, in the U.S., they're talking about defund the police. We could think about defunding the police in the Philippines. And for those people who think that defunding the police is such a controversial thing, consider this fact. I'm an academic. Um, I work in education. In education, we get defunded all the time. We lose our funding, and the funding gets transferred everywhere because they don't think we're important, right? So if you can defund teachers, you can defund police. And what that really just means is that you know, instead of spending so much money in the police, maybe we should spend more money on drug rehab in the Philippines, right? Um, instead of spending so much money on the police, we should spend more money on whatever, firemen, barangay tanods, uh, maybe not, not so sure about barangay tanods, but you get the picture, right? Police reform is very important. Now, um, another question from Christopher. Uh, same question, yeah. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. Um, anyone else? Hello from Facebook. This is from Ms. Chit Asi, our friend, Ma'am Chit. So she is asking, maybe your question is more of how we can make more young people aware of what Rizal is trying to teach us. Um, because siguro, survey na lang din dito sa mga kasama natin sa Zoom ngayon, kukonti lang yung nasa young, young bracket talaga. Pero I understand that you've been approached by the liberal youth to give a similar yeah. discussion. So, generally speaking, how do we um, address the young ones in making them appreciate, you know, what Rizal is trying to teach us? Yeah, I, I try to avoid yung kind of cliche pontificating like yung ang kabataan yung pag-asa ng kinabukasan because I, I seriously think na if you talk to youths and then you tell them these things, their their eyes just kind of glaze over because it's cliche. And I think that's one of the reasons also why we're losing the anti-Marcos battle because uh, anti-Marcos battle has largely been a battle of cliches, you know, like a few don't remember history, you'll repeat history. So one thing I'll do is I, I won't resort to cliches because I think the young people are sick of these cliches. Um, to get people to appreciate Rizal, I think you have to show that he is still offering solutions to problems today, creative solutions at that. I already mentioned one solution, which is the solution about reforming the security sector. But other solutions include changes in mindset. Like, for example, um, Rizal was, of course, somebody who liked to compare himself with the rest of the world. Um, Benedict, and it, it, Benedict Anderson talks about this scene in No Limit Angire, where in Ibarra goes to the botanical gardens in Manila. And when he goes into the bot botanical gardens, He's reminded of the botanical gardens in Spain. And the narrator says, Ibarra gets hunted by los demonios de comparaciones, uh, the demon of comparison. Los demonios de comparaciones, which is you know, kind of a beautiful line in the result. So I think that's, what, that's one of the things he teaches us. We should always be hunted by the demon of comparison. We shouldn't think that we're so special that there is one Filipino way of doing things. And unfortunately, this is one of the th things that you get from a lot of DDS these days. Diba? When you tell them, for example, drug war didn't work in Colombia, eh, mas magaling kami dito sa Pilipinas, mas magaling si Tatay Digong. 
drug war didn't work in the United States, ah, mas magaling si Tatay Digong, best president in the solar system, right? So there's no specter of comparison. There's no capacity to learn from what's happening outside. And ostensibly, the reason why there is no comparison there is because they claim to be nationalists, right? There is a Filipino way. But that's a kind of false nationalism because the nationalism that Rizal advocated for was always a comparative nationalism. So, let, so, so what we can learn from Rizal on a, on a conceptual level is, yes, you love your country, but you love your country in the context of your country developing amongst, alongside other nations. So it's a kind of nationalist internationalism. Uh, Fernando Mendoza, very interesting question. Can I take this, Bea? Uh, I'll just go through yung sa, sa chat unless sure, yeah, they're pressing. Yeah, okay. Um, Gerald Angel Eladio Peñarada, Rizal did want to join the revolution for he did want violence for he believes the pen is mightier than the sword. Um, in his administration, uh, I think, uh, you know, Rizal, so I, I encourage people to read the work of Laura Kub Laura Kibuyan, and he makes the argument that Rizal actually was for revolution, and I agree he was for revolution. The only place where I disagree with Floro is uh, Kibuyan, Kibuyan makes the argument, Kibuyan thinks that because Rizal supported the revolution, therefore he was not a liberal, which to me again is weird, right? Because if you supported revolution in the 19th century, then obviously you were liberal because revolutionaries in the 19th century were liberal. Um, but anyway, he makes a great argument there that Rizal actually endorsed the revolution. And, you know, this pen mightier than the sword thing is actually a very, I think it's a kind of very illiberal statement because for liberals, there are no fixed solutions. So if you say the pen is always mightier than the sword, then you, 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 already, you already fixed yourself into that solution of pen always being mightier than the sword. But what, what if there are really times when a government is so repressive that you have no choice, right? This is obviously what the American, what the revolutionaries in the U.S. did, right? And in fact, Rizal said in one of his letters that if you Spaniards repress our freedom so much, we'll have no choice but to imitate the North Americans. What does that mean? We're going to revolt. So, you know, revolution was always an open question to Rizal, right? Um, speaking of economics, how would you characterize Rizal's economic philosophy? Uh, this is a very good question from Mr. Fernando Mendoza. Speaking of economics, how would you characterize Rizal's economic philosophy, a classic liberal or somebody like neoclassical like Keynes? Well, there was no Keynesianism at that time. So there was no, there was no such thing as counter-cyclical spending at that time. And I don't think, I personally don't think that Rizal's economic ideas were really well developed, especially when you compare them to some of his contemporaries who were a bit more attuned to economics, like Gregorio Sanzianco. Actually, Sanzianco was a, was a bit older than Rizal. Um, having said that, so I think that his notion of economics was a kind of economics that believed in self-help, but it also believed in some amount of government intervention. But to be honest with you, it's not something I really studied as much because I, I actually don't, you know, you know, the thing, the thing with Rizal is Rizal Day, we tend to glorify him. There are certain things that Rizal didn't do well, and I'm not sure that economics was one of his strong suits, but actually one of his, one of his weak weaknesses was not economics, and I was talking to Wolfgang about this earlier. We can talk about it if you want to ask is One of his weaknesses, but I, I think he was a poor historian. He's a great political philosopher, probably mid-level economic thinker, poor historian. And I can talk about examples of that later on. All right, anyway. Um, but as a political theorist and as a novelist, top tier, of course. Um, Rowener Bautista, in the history of the world, was there any country who transformed to author authoritarianism by their leader and became successful nation for doing so? Yes. Um, you know, I think the, the Lutertistas keep talking about Singapore. Um, but Singapore is an atypical example because Singapore is a small island state, uh, island state, a small city state. It is, of course, a lot easier to govern than the Philippines. The government, the authoritarian government that really transitioned from first world to third world that's more comparable to the Philippines is actually Park chung Korea. Right? Um, and that was because of developmental policy. So, 
you know, we can't take away from the park government. They really did make Korea one of the richest countries in the world almost overnight. In terms of world history standards, they, they actually less than overnight, within a sec, almost like within a second, you know. Um, but, and this is a different topic now, but I don't necessarily think that it was authoritarianism that made Korea rich. I think they became rich while being an authoritarian state, but they could have done the same things without necessarily being a dictatorship. That's just me, um, but good question. Um, from Merila Murillo, Murillo Pechi, Miss, Miss, Miss Pechi, don't you think that in the Far East, with the exception of Osiris Sal, there's a lack of liberal tradition? How can you see a future liberalism in the Far East having powerful liberal, illiberal country like China? And don't you think Osiris Sal is an exception in the context of uh, the Asian tradition? Well, you know, there's always Nehru who, 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 who can be situated in that liberal tradition in Vietnam. You have the tradition of colonial republicanism, which is also a tradition of liberalism. So in Vietnam, they have uh, an author who's very similar to Rizal, wrote kind of anti-colonial, also very liberal text. His name is Vu Trong Fung, right? So the Rizal of Vietnam. And then, and then if you look at India as a whole, then if you look at their constitution, if you look at their laws, if you look at a lot of their thinkers, their thinkers are very similar to us. So they do have a liberal tradition. And that's why, you know, the, the transition to authoritarianism under Modi is almost, is just as disappointing as the transition to authoritarianism that's happening in the Philippines. So I think if you want to think about liberalism in Asia. Definitely, we've had liberalism in Asia, and it's, it's a strong tradition in Asia. But let's assume it wasn't. Let's assume it wasn't. I still think liberalism is a good idea. So for example, the DNA, the structure of the DNA, the helix structure of the DNA, that was not discovered in Asia. That was discovered in Cambridge. Would it be salutary for us to believe in the helix structure of the DNA? I think so, even if it wasn't developed in Asia. So liberalism, a lot of it was developed in the West, true. A lot of it was developed in places like Spain, places like Germany, places like the United States. Does it benefit us to adopt this philosophy? Yes. I think we should assess, I think one of the, if you look at the 60s, um, again, the, the uh, the historical education in the 60s, the question that they kept asking during that time is, where did this come from? Sa atin ba talaga to? Galing ba talaga ang Pilipinas to? And I think we keep getting bogged down by this question of where does X, Y, or Z come from? Instead of asking where X, Y, or Z comes from, why don't you just ask, is it a good idea? I, I think that's a more basic question. So I'm like, yeah, I can make an argument that liberalism also comes from the Philippines and I can make a very persuasive argument there. But assuming I wasn't able to make that argument, my conclusion is that regardless of where it, where it comes from, it's a great idea. Uh, and that's internationalism for me. Um, thanks. So thank you for that very brilliant question um, from Tito Bobby Mendiola, a good friend of my grandparents. Um, current PH history, Marcos toppled, Arab unseated, who or what were the triggers of both? Is the Philippines on the brink of a third removal? Do you see an emerging trigger during this time? Thanks. Um, I share the opinion of scholars like uh, Mark Thompson, um, Julio Tihanki, uh, political scientists who know much better than I do about these things, that the Philippines essentially has people power fatigue. So it's not likely to happen under Duterte. And also, you know, we can bury our heads in the sand but eventually I'll have to confront the fact that the popularity of rating of Duterte is still in the 80s. And, you know, assuming that he takes, uh, that he slides because of his handling of COVID, I think the popularity is not, maybe it's not going to be 80, but it's, it might be 70, it might be 60, you know? So he could drop, but because he's coming from such a high place, 80s, 90s, he drops, he's probably still going to end up high. Right, and and th that means it's still going to be difficult to defeat Duterte. And one of the reasons why I think it's impossible for Duterte to have a catastrophic drop, the way GMA had a catastrophic drop, catastrophic plummet in popularity, is because he holds Mindanao. So he, if the Marcoses have a solid north, it's very clear from the data that Duterte has a solid south. So any ouster of Duterte will be seen as a kind of assault on 
the interests of Mindanao, whether it's true or not, right? Because I don't actually think that Duterte is beneficial from for Mindanao. Okay, uh, next question from FB. Lorelai Aquino, how do you think we should, the world should endure this reign of global authoritarianism before <laughs> liberalism makes a comeback? Um, well, one first, I think, take care of yourselves. Um, you know, um, because I was just so depressed at the state of things, I, I kind of took a break, uh, left social media for almost a year. I decided to concentrate on more ac or on academic things, focused on staying at home, going to the gym, right? I'm actually trained to become a personal trainer. I'm not even going to train anyone. Um, but just because I needed something else, you know, I just needed something else. Uh, so, so I think that's one thing people should do. They should take care of themselves. They should ensure that there is some level of self-care, whatever that is for you, taking walks, meditation, because it's going to be a long haul and you have to be emotionally and psychologically prepared. And the reason why emotional and psychological preparedness is important is because you're going to hear things you don't like. And if you're not psychologically or emotionally prepared, you're going to deny them. I see a lot of people, for example, these days denying Duterte's popularity. Right? Ah, it's not true. You know, the survey companies are fake. And I think that comes from the fact that they don't want to grapple with the truth. But if we don't want to grapple with the truth, if we're not emotionally ready to grapple with the truth, then we're not any better than the, than the DDS who spread fake news. We're just like them. We just believe what we want to believe. So I think in order to prevent ourselves from being the type of people who believe what we want to believe, we have to be emotionally and mentally strong. And that means self-care. And uh, it's going to take a long time. This, this, this struggle is going to be a long struggle and we all have to be prepared. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, <coughs> um, from Mr. Zulia, Dante Zulia, any suggestion to promote advancing liberalism as an ideology in the Philippines? Well, <laughs> you promote it the way you want to promote it, right? Um, we promote it in different ways. I'm an academic, so I write about the history of liberalism. And my entire gambit is if I show people that liberalism is a deep tradition in the Philippines, and it's been a use, not just a deep tradition, but also a useful tradition in the Philippines, that more people will subscribe to it. So not only, have I, not only do I do these lectures, I write these books, but I've also written you know, textbooks. And I tried to insert some of these liberal histories into these particular textbooks as an educator. Um, I don't know what you do, Mr. Zulia. Um, maybe you can put in the chat box what it is that you do. But based on what you do, you'll have, you'll, you, your, your contribution would be different. And I think that it behooves us to ask, like, what's our profession? What are, what are our talents? What do we like? What are we good at? And then based on those questions, we, we, we kind of we kinda determine what we do to promote um, the ideology that we believe in. Oh, from Carlo Vargas, a friend of mine, uh, used to work in the same office. Um, Carlo asked, how did Rizal conceptualize the Filipino nation? Was it limited to lowland Christianized Filipinos or extended to Moro communities and even the entire peoples under the Spanish Indies? Uh, no. You know, he actually looked down on the Moros. Um, it was he, he did not think of them as equal to the lowland Tagalogs. It's a very sad thing. And, you know, he looked down on what you call the quote-unquote negritos. So, again, let's not romanticize as a result. Uh, I'd like people to read the article by Filomeno Aguilar on racial migra migration wave theory in the Philippines. You know, that very racist, um, that very racist theory that they taught us in grade school. Una, dumating ang mga negrito. Tapos, dumating ang mga Indones. Tapos, dumating yung mga Malay, right? It's actually a very racist theory because it's a theory of evolution, right? So, the negritos are the most basic people and then the fully evolved people are the Malays, right? It's actually a racist theory and it's been proven to be incorrect. Now, Rizal was prone to promote that kind of bunk, um, what we know now to be bunk. And so, therefore... And so Rizal was not the best when it came to issues of race. Um, but of, of course, he was, a, he was a man of his time. So we can't do anything about it. Um, does that make him less of a hero? I don't think so. You know, many of, 
if, if we use these criteria to assess heroes from the 19th century, nobody would be a hero by today's standards, right? Nobody from the 19th century is going to be perfect by today's standards. Um, from, from FB, from Mr. Jun Aksai, how do we apply the idea of liberalism as pointed out by Rizal in the present situation? In what way can we regain the freedom which this government has taken? And again, I go back to my answer, which is what do you do? What are your talents? Uh, what do you like to do? And whatever that is, use that. Um, having said that, of course, we can't obviously just be individualistic about it. We have to form ties of solidarity with other people, with other movements, with other people who want the same thing. Um, and speaking of self-care, you know, self-care can only be done with friends. So this is really the time where I think, you know, we should try to lift each other up and be friends. Because again, long haul, emotional stability is very important. Lalaban tayo pero matagalan to. Um, from Marie Lopez, do you feel safer in the Philippines than staying in the Philippines at this point in time? Absolutely, yes. Um, uh, for unfortunately, um, I was, I remember last year I was still in DLSU and Maria Ressa uh, did a tour of the United States. She went to New York. Uh, she was the graduation speaker for the Columbia School of Journalism and then he, she went here to the Bay, he came here to the Bay Area as well. And then she returned to the Philippines and on the day of her return she went straight to La Salle and gave a very defiant speech. And at that point, I realized that this Maria is in for the long haul and that she is really willing to go, for, go to jail for her beliefs. And she's that brave because she could have just stayed in the U.S. She's a U.S. citizen. She could have sought political asylum here. And personally, you know, that's what I would have done because I am not as brave as her. Not, not everyone's going to be as brave as her. And by the way, don't think that for you to make a difference, you need to be as brave as Maria. Not everyone is capable of that. If you are, good on you, of course, but not everyone is a hero. Some people are going to contribute in different ways. Some people are going to stay, are going to be in jail. Some people are going to choose to be safe and choose to fight in another way. I think that's fine, right? But personally, yeah, I feel safer here. And I really don't think, you know, if I were in Maria's shoes, I'd be able to do what she did. And, um, but that's the definition of a hero. Somebody who can do things that you think you're incapable of doing. Somebody who, who, commits, who um, commits acts of bravery that you'd be too afraid to do. So she's a hero. Um, next question uh, from... Uh, Peter Albert Go again, observing how Duterte runs the country. Are you seeing any ounce of liberalism in him? <laughs> you know, the strange thing, just to give you an idea of how deep the liberal tradition in the Philippines is, meron ba sa inyo dito na binasa ulit yung inauguration speech ni Duterte? In the chat room, can you let me know the two people that President Rodrigo Duterte quoted in his... Uh, in his uh, inaugura in inaugural speech. Trivia. I give you five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. The two people he mentioned are Franklin Del Delano Roosevelt, biggest name in American liberalism for some people, and Abraham Lincoln, another famous liberal, who was actually close to Marx. Um, but he was a liberal. Uh, <clears throat> well, not so close, but he corresponded with Marx. So, even the, th the strange thing about the Philippines is even our dictators feel the need to speak in liberal terms. Right? And when President Marcos became president and implemented martial law, Salvador P. Lopez, who I think is the greatest liberal of the 20th century, uh, Rizal was the greatest liberal of the 19th century. Greatest Filipino liberal of the 20th century was Salvador P. Lopez. Um, Salvador P. Lopez said that this Marcos is probably is a crypto democrat. He is a fake dictator. Deep inside, he's really a democrat and a liberal. Of course, Lopez was wrong, but that just goes to show that even the most authoritarian Filipino presidents have to speak this language, and I think that's an advantage to us. 
because linguistically we already have an advantage. How we exploit that language, I'm not so sure. Okay, um, I'll take one last question. One last question from the chat. Uh, okay, um, Bea says somebody was raising their hands. Yes, um, you would like to give the floor to Mr. Bernardo Eres. Kanina pa po siya nag-raise ng hand. Pasensya na po ngayon. <laughs> sir. Yes, thank Pasensya you. Pasensya na po, sir. Okay, thank you. Is my uh, audio loud and clear? Opa, opa. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, from a personal note, I really appreciate this opportunity to have a conversation with a resource person who is very, very persuasive in discussing the assigned topic to him. Uh, Salamat day is Rizal Day. Uh, honestly, uh, <laughs> very few of the writings of Rizal I was able to read, except that I attended my, my Rizal during my... Um, school uh, college days no so that's only my my knowledge about Rizal and of course uh, readings um i became very interested of the title of the talk because Rizal was attributed uh, as liberal radical but while listening to the resource person i have a reaction to my mind that uh, who would say that Rizal is truly a liberal or radical. No? So this would be a, you know, a endless conversation, discourse, to really point out that Rizal was a liberal in his time or Rizal was radical in his own time. No? Anyway, my own understanding of Rizal after learning about his life because of his liberal education, a very strong liberal education he got from Europe and other countries, that makes me to understand that he is closer to a liberal person. Uh, I, I also appreciate that the resource person differentiated a liberalism with a you know a democratic uh, country, you no? Know? Uh, because uh, the extreme understanding of liberalism that it's it's already contradicting law or uh, Meaning to say, uh, there's no law. No, I want freedom for myself. I want to do things on my own. I don't want law. So that, that's too much. No, so I really appreciate the, the distinction made by the uh, presenter that uh, a, a freedom that is uh, you know regulated, controlled, and that is where we need the state. So I think that is where the Liberal Party coming in. No, uh, I, I wish also to celebrate with this kind of opportunity, the listening to the presenter, my 10th year in the Liberal Party. I joined the Liberal Party in 2010, and this would be my 10th year. So, sir, I really thank you uh, with your presentation. Uh, it, you have ignited, once again, my passion to serve this country. So thank you for that. Anyway, um, a personal, uh, Maybe a question would be, um, well, so, yeah, I, I'll go back to that point. No? Who, who would say that uh, Rizal was really a liberal or a, a radical? No? So it's a, a very perfect, uh, uh, you know, a topic for mm -hmm. <laughs> discourse and conversation. And I think the, the presenter today, this morning, uh, uh, is worthy to be appreciated because you have succeeded to teach us about Rizal in a manner that he is mm, perhaps closer to be liberal and radical. Uh, for my last note, if I am in my college days right now and I happen to hear you, I would be a, a radical youth or student leader uh, in my time. But anyway, I, I miss that. Sir, thank you very much. Have a pleasant day. Good morning to all. You have a great day, sir. Um, uh, just, just a brief reaction. I mean, I'm not the first to, well, you know, academic traditions are kind of weather, weather lang din. So I'm not the first person to focus on results liberalism. I mean, the first person I think who really talked about that at great length was Rizal's biog uh, one of his best biographers, Leon Maria Guerrero, who was also an atlista. So I think for some reason, kami sa Ateneo were more likely to talk about Rizal as a liberal and to enjoy the fact that he was a liberal. Whereas 
historians from other universities, <laughs> just kidding, um, are, are a bit more iffy on the question of liberalism. I'm just making fun that's of why you have, none. That's why you have Rizal Library. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rizal Library in the Neo. Okay, sir, so thank you. Salamat thank you very much. Are there any questions from the, any other questions, Bea, from? Um, the I'm NGA not address? seeing any questions anymore, but yeah, if any of you ever come up with any question for Leloy, um, feel free to send it to us at FNF. Tapos subukan po natin send yun kay Leloy para masagot niya. No. Um, anyway, sige. Um, Salamat, Leloy. Maraming salamat okay. sa pagkakataon yeah. na pinigay niyo sa amin. And i-echo ko na lang din po yung sinabi ni Mr. Eres na na-appreciate ng mga tao itong ganitong klase ng discussion. Also, dito sinabi mo na yung pag-promote ng liberalism ay nakadepende sa kaya natin gawin as individuals by sa profession natin, sa mga gusto natin gawin. So, I think people here are more inspired to promote liberalism in their own ways. Um, I would just like to close this session by asking the participants to answer the poll para alam natin kung ano yung mga gagawin natin i-cover nating topics sa mga susunod nating ano, susunod nating mga discussion.